good morning and uh, welcome to this the lecture number 31 of the course stochastic hydrology uh, in the last lecture what uh, we essentially did is uh, to use the idea of relationships intensity duration frequency relationships and convert it into the design hydrographs that was the first portion of the lecture but in the subsequent part of the lecture we introduced a new topic uh, this was to deal with uh, multiple linear regression. So, starting with the simple linear regression where we are relating one dependent variable y with one independent variable x in a linear form y is equal to ax plus b. We extended that to relate one dependent variable y with several independent variables x1, x2, x3, etcetera in a linear form and we saw uh, how to obtain the coefficients uh, beta 1, beta 2, etcetera when we are expressing y as a function of x 1, x 2, x 3, etcetera with the coefficients uh, defined as beta 1, beta 2 and so on. Uh, towards the end of the lecture I mentioned that uh, the independent variables x 1, x 2, x 3 and so on in the multiple linear regression may be correlated among themselves and also the number of variables that you may uh, consider may be so large that the size of the problem itself becomes quite unmanageable in many uh, realistic situations. And that is where we introduce the principal component analysis where we will deal with a set of uncorrelated variables and also uh, we may use only a few of these uncorrelated variables so that the size of the problems problem itself may reduce and that is what is called as the principal component analysis. So, in today's lecture we will introduce the principal component analysis. So, this is what we covered in the last uh, lecture we uh, discussed about the design hydrographs from idea of relationships and then we introduced multiple linear regression. We also discussed a problem related with multiple linear regression. So, today we will start with principal component analysis. Now, before going to the principal component analysis, we need to revise a bit of matrix algebra. Uh, as you recall, you know two matrices can be multiplied if their sizes are compatible, what do I mean by compatibility? Uh, let us say you have a n by p matrix and another p q matrix. So, the number of columns of the first matrix equal to number of rows of the second matrix, then you can multiply two matrices. So, we get n by q in that particular example. We also know from your uh, uh, from our earlier earlier matrix algebra that a square matrix has associated with it eigen values and eigen vectors. So we we will start with a revision of the eigen vectors and eigen values, which are necessary for discussing the principal component analysis. Uh, at least some of you would have gone through the matrix algebra uh, earlier. When we say two matrices are multi uh, can be multiplied as I mentioned, let us say you have a n by p matrix and then you have a p by q matrix. When you multiply this you will get a n by q matrix. Uh, the concept of hygiene vectors is closely associated with the matrix multiplication. Uh, we say for a square matrix that is if you have a n by n matrix it can have eigen vectors. So, the eigen vectors are defined essentially for square matrix 
and not all square matrices can have eigenvectors. So, some of the square matrices need not have eigenvectors that is the second one. Second point not all square matrices have eigenvectors. Now, what are these eigenvectors and how we determine etcetera we will see presently. Then if a n by n square matrix has a eigenvector, let us say that you are considering n by n square matrix, square matrix. If it has eigenvectors, then it has exactly n eigenvectors. and associated with each of the eigenvector you have n eigenvalues. Uh, so, if you have uh, a n by n square matrix you can you will have n eigenvectors and at most n eigen n distinct eigenvalues. So, how to determine this we will see today in today's class. Uh, it is also important for you to understand that the eigenvectors are uh, orthogonal to each other uh, in the in the sense that they are perpendicular to each other. Remember that the vector indicates a direction. So, therefore, when you consider two uh, eigenvectors, the eigenvectors will be normal to each other or orthogonal to each other. We will now see how we determine the eigenvalues and eigenvectors which are necessary for carrying out the principal component analysis. Uh, just so that you do not lose sight of what we are uh, discussing, the principal component analysis essentially we apply when you have to deal with multiple uh, regression where you are dealing with a large number of independent variables. So, typically let us say you are talking about hydrologic applications where you want to estimate runoff at a particular location as a dependent variable and it is uh, dependent on several independent variables. Let us say rainfall it is dependent and the area of the catchment it is dependent on, it is dependent on the soil moisture, it may be dependent on the humidity so, and the uh, temperature and so on. So, you want to relate the runoff at a particular location with all the independent variables. Now, these independent variables that you are uh, talking about may be uh, may have a correlation among themselves in the sense that one variable may be dependent on the other, but we are still calling them as independent in as much as they are not dependent on y or the runoff in this particular case. For example, your soil moisture may be related with rainfall and rainfall and soil moisture together are considered in the uh, regression equation. So, to account for the correlations among the independent variables or actually to remove the correlations among the independent variables and form another set of variables which are uncorrelated with each other and to possibly reduce the size of the problem itself. What I mean by that is let us say you had 10 variables y is equal to y is a function of x 1, x 2, x 3 etcetera 10 variables and each of the 10 variables has 50 years of data and monthly data is what you are considering. So, each of the variables has 600 values. So, the problem dimension is 10 into 600. Now, that may become slightly unwieldy and therefore, to remove the correlations among the independent variables and to possibly reduce the size of the problem, we carry out the principal component analysis. And especially when you are dealing with the uh, climate change impacts on hydrology. Uh, towards the end of the lecture, uh, uh, towards the end of this course I will give one lecture on how do we handle the scaling issues uh, when we are dealing with uh, climate change impacts. There it will become much more, uh, prom uh, much more uh, clear on where we use the principal component analysis. <coughs> Especially when you are dealing with the scaling issues in the uh, climate change impacts, you deal with large number of climate variables and therefore, it is important for us to reduce the uh, size of the problem and also to address the problem of correlations among the independent variables. 
and that is what we do in the principal component analysis. Okay, so, let us start with the basics of uh, the principal component analysis. What does it do actually? It is a way of identifying patterns in the data. You have 10 variables, all of the 10 variables you have measured and you have the observed data on all of the 10 variables. So, there is a huge amount of data that is available to you. The underlying pattern in this data set is what is captured by the principal component analysis. So, PCA is a way of identifying the underlying patterns in the data. And then once we identify the patterns, we express this data in such a way that the similarities among the data and the differences among them are highlighted in some sense. And once the pattern is found in the data, the data can be compressed without losing too much of information. What do I mean by that? Let us say that in the pattern of the data, you see that some components in some sense which we will see presently, some components are much more predominant in the in their information content compared to other components. Then you can only, only uh, focus on these particular components which are much more predominant in their information content and that is what we mean by uh, the data can be compressed. In fact, in image analysis etcetera, the image compression uses principal component analysis in uh, several situations. Now, this will require uh, a bit of background on matrix algebra. So, we will just quickly go through uh, some preliminaries of the matrix algebra, especially how we obtain the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues. So, first let us define what is a eigenvector and a eigenvalue. Let us say A is a square matrix and lambda is a scalar and x is a non-zero column vector satisfying A x is equal to lambda into x. So, let me uh, demonstrate that, that is uh, we have A as a square matrix and this is a column vector, lambda is a scalar and this is a column vector. Now, this column vector x is a eigenvector of A. and lambda is an eigenvalue of A. That is, if you can form, if you can find a vector x which satisfies this A x is equal to lambda x with lambda as a scalar and x being a column vector. If you can find such a vector, then it is called as an eigenvector of A and the associated value lambda is called as eigenvalue of A. Now, as I mentioned earlier, eigenvectors are possible only for square matrices and the eigenvectors x are orthogonal to each other. Let us say you had two eigenvectors, then both of them will be normal to each other. Vector denotes a direction and therefore, when you, you can talk about the direction of a vector and the two uh, eigenvectors will be orthogonal to each other or normal to each other. Then lambda is an eigenvalue of n by n matrix A with corresponding eigenvector x. So, each of the eigenvector is associated with the eigenvalue lambda. Uh, look at this now A x is equal to lambda x. This is how you define your eigenvector x. Now, if I write A minus lambda i into x is equal to 0 with x not equal to 0. this leads to the determinant a minus lambda i is equal to 0. And this is how we determine uh, the values lambda. That is, if a minus lambda i into x is equal to 0, you can either have x is equal to 0 or a minus lambda i equal to 0, but we are saying that x is not equal to 0 because 
you are uh, stating that eigen vectors exist and therefore, you will get a minus lambda i the determinant of that must be equal to 0. This is how we determine the uh, lambda or the eigen values. As you can see here, uh, this is the n by n matrix, a is a n by n matrix and therefore, you may get a uh, maximum of n distinct eigen values of a. You may have n values, but some of them may be equal to each other and therefore, you will get maximum of n distinct eigen values of a. So, these are the two important things that uh, you must remember. One is you will determine the uh, eigen vector x by this expression a x is equal to lambda x and the other one is that you will determine the eigen values a minus lambda i is equal to 0, the uh, determinant of the a minus lambda i is equal to 0 and that is how you determine the eigen values lambda. Any given uh, square matrix first you determine the eigen values, then use the eigen values in this expression to get the eigen vectors. So, let us uh, look at one uh, simple example now. Let us say you take a square matrix A 1 2 2 1 very simple matrix, we will first obtain the eigen values. So, A minus lam lambda i this is the identity matrix i. So, A minus lambda i determinant of that is equal to 0. So, we will get 1 minus lambda I am uh, picking up from here 1 minus lambda and 2 2 and 1 minus lambda that is how you form the a minus lambda i i is a unit matrix remember 1 0 0 1 in this particular case. So, from here this is the determinant. So, I can form an expression for lambda this is equal to 0. So, I will get this as 1 minus lambda into 1 minus lambda minus 4 is equal to 0 or you get the expression lambda square minus 2 lambda minus 3 is equal to 0 from here and when you solve this is a quadratic. So, when you solve this you get two solutions lambda is equal to 3 or lambda is equal to minus 1 both of these satisfy this e expression and these are the lambda uh, the eigen values for the matrix A. So, the eigen values are 3 and minus 1 for the matrix A you had a 2 by 2 matrix therefore, maximum of 2 eigen values are possible and that these are the 2 values that you obtain. In some situations when you have 2 by 2 matrix for example, you may get both of them equal to each other in which case there is only one eigen value. So, there are maximum of n distinct eigen values possible for a square matrix of the size n by n and always you obtain the eigen values first and use the eigen values to obtain the eigen vectors. So, we will now obtain the eigen vectors once you have found eigen values. Remember corresponding to each of the eigen vectors there is a eigen value or they come in pairs eigen values and the eigen vectors they come in pairs. So, you have through uh, two lambda values and corresponding to each of these lambda values we must find one eigen vector now. The eigen vectors are obtained by a minus lambda i into x is equal to 0, these are matrices a minus lambda i into x is equal to 0 and I specify the lambda value to obtain the value of x. So, I had two values of lambda, so I will first start with lambda 1 is equal to 3 and substitute lambda 1 is equal to 3 in a minus lambda 1 i into x 1 is equal to 0, i is a unit vector and therefore, from this a here which is 1 2 2 1 I will get 1 minus 3 2 2 1 minus 3 because lambda is 3 I am putting lambda 1 into i, i is a unit matrix and I will write this x 1 as x 1 y 1 this is the eigen vector now. So, I will get this as minus 2 2 2 minus 2 and this leads to two equations minus 2 x 1 plus 2 y 1 is equal to 0, 2 x 1 minus 2 y 1 is equal to 0. <coughs> the equations that you get out of solution of these 
are identical. For example, you can uh, multiply this with minus minus 1. So, you will get 2 x 1 minus 2 y 1 which is identical to this. So, from this I can write x 1 is equal to minus y 1 I am sorry you can write x 1 is equal to y 1 here and for any chosen x 1 arbitrary you can choose x 1 arbitrary you can get the eigen vector x 1 y 1 your eigen vector was x 1 y 1 and the solution is x 1 is equal to y 1. So, any chosen x 1 you will get the corresponding y 1 as x 1 is equal to y as y 1 is equal to x 1 and therefore, you will get the eigen vectors. So, the eigen vectors corresponding to the eigen value lambda 1 is equal to 3 are the vectors x 1 y 1 with x 1 not equal to 0 <coughs> because that is what we have specified earlier. For example, if you take x 1 is equal to 2 as I said any arbitrary value of x 1 satisfying x 1 is equal to y 1 will define your eigen vectors. So, if you take x 1 is equal to 2 y 1 is equal to 2 then the eigen vector is 2 comma 2 corresponding to the eigen value lambda 1 is equal to 3. So, like this you can form several uh, eigen vectors. Now, we will take the other lambda 1 which is lambda 1 is equal to minus 1. If you put lambda 1 is equal to minus 1 I will get 2 and 2 remember your a is this matrix 1 2 2 1. So, I am saying 1 minus 1 that is minus of minus 1 which will be plus 2 and here 1 minus minus 1 that will be again 2. So, this is how you get 2 2 2 2 x 2 y 2 this x 2 which is a vector I will write it as x 2 y 2 and you will get the equation 2 x 2 plus 2 y 2 is equal to 0 which is identical to the second one. This has a solution x 2 is equal to minus y 2. So, you can choose x 2 arbitrary and then you get y 2 and you will get the uh, vector here x 2 minus y 2. So, the eigen vectors corresponding to lambda 2 is equal to minus 1 are these are the vectors you can choose any value of x 2 and set x 2 is equal to minus y 2 and that is how you get with x 2 not equal to 0. So, this is how you obtain the eigen vectors and the eigen values. As I mentioned given any square matrix if you want to determine the eigen vectors first you find the eigen values by taking determinant a minus lambda i that determinant equal to 0 a is a square matrix and i is a unit matrix. <coughs> you will get at most n distinct lambda values for a square matrix of size n by n. Use these n distinct lambda values to obtain the uh, corresponding eigen vectors. How do we get this? That will be a x is equal to lambda into x and x is the eigen vector. So, corresponding to each of the lambda values you get one uh, eigen vector and uh, eigen vectors and eigen values come in pairs. So, we will use this uh, method of obtaining the eigen vectors and eigen values when we go to the principal component analysis. So, let us see what we do in the principal component analysis now. As I mentioned you have several variables and on each of the variables you have the data available to you. Let us say that uh, uh, you have uh, as I mentioned earlier uh, you have variables such as rainfall, soil moisture, temperature, humidity and so on. So, on and so you have several such variables and your dependent variable may be runoff at a particular location and you have the data observed data on each of these variables. So, you have uh, data on p variables and these some among these may be correlated. Let us say rainfall uh, may be related with uh, temperature in some sense or the soil moisture is related with rainfall 
and evapotranspiration is related with both soil moisture as well as temperature. So, there may be uh, significant correlations among the several variables. Now, what do we mean by correlation? If you recall from your earlier lectures on this uh, course, correlation actually means that there is a common information, there is a information contained in one variable is also contained in some other variable and this information we have to filter out, so that we do not repeat what is contained in several variables. So, the PCA or the principal component analysis in some of the textbooks you will also see this is called as principal components analysis, but they are analogous. So, the PCA actually transforms the P original correlated variables into P uncorrelated components these are called as a principal components or they are also called as orthogonal components in as much as they are orthogonal to each other. They are vectors and therefore, they are all orthogonal to each other. Now, these components are actually linear functions of the original variables. So, you do a linear transformation of the original variables into some uh, orthogonal axis. So, you are actually transforming the original data into some orthogonal components and these are linear transformations. Let us say we write the transformation as z is equal to x into a. Now, x is your n by p matrix of n observations on p variables. Uh, uh, will not lose sight of what we are doing here. So, we will just go through our uh, hydrology example. Let us say I have three variables, one is rainfall, another is runoff and another is let us say soil moisture. You have three such variables. On each of these variables, so these are the variables. On each of these variables, you have number of observations. Let us say you have 1, 2, 3, etcetera. You have n number of observations. If you have 50 years of monthly data, n will be 600. So, this is p and this is n. So, the x vector which is a, a x matrix which is a matrix of the observed data will have a size of n by p and that is what I am writing here. So, this is x is n by p matrix of uh, n observations on p variables. And now, z is a n by p matrix of n values for each of the p components. Now, a is our uh, matrix of components. First, let us look at a. You had p variables, let us say you had 3 variables, then p is equal to 3. Now, a is a 3 by 3 matrix of coefficients defining the linear transformation. This is in fact, the principal components. And z is the transformed data. So, from the original data, on the original data, you apply the principal components to get the transformed data and that is a z uh, matrix. Now, when we are doing the analysis, we take the x matrix as a uh, deviation matrix. That means, from the observed data, you deduct the mean and many times you divide it by standard deviation also to form the x matrix and A is a matrix of p uh, coefficients, p by p coefficients which we will see how to obtain this now and z will give you the transformed data. So, this is what we essentially do in uh, principal component analysis. Okay. So, how do we uh, do the principal component analysis? We have n observations on p variables, we start with that data. 
uh, in fact you relate this with what we discussed in the multiple linear regression. You have observations corresponding to each of the variables and there is a dependent variable there are large number of independent variables. Now from this matrix of n observations on p variables you form a matrix of size n by p with deviations from mean for each of the variables. Now typically we do this on the independent variables. So you pick up all the independent variables and then deduct their mean and formulate a star, uh, matrix of size n by p. Then this is a n by p matrix so we can obtain the covariance matrix there are p variables so we also obtain a p by p covariance matrix that is correlation of variable x1 with x2 x1 with x3 and so on x1 with xp similarly xp with x1 xp with x2 and so on so you get a covariance matrix of p by p now this is a square matrix so we can obtain the eigen vectors and eigen values for this square matrix so we obtain the eigen vectors and eigen values for this covariance matrix this is a p by p matrix therefore we can get p eigen vectors and at most p distinct eigen values from these p eigen vectors we can choose some eigen vectors for further analysis using regression depending on how important they are in terms of the information content on the dependent variable we will come to that slightly later but from these eigen vectors we pick up uh, some of the eigen vectors which, which we call it as principal components and use this expression z is equal to x into a to obtain the transformed data set so this is what we do i will just quickly go through it we start with the data and then the data we convert it into uh, a n by p matrix with deviations from the mean x minus x bar and in some cases we take x minus x bar by sigma or x minus x bar by s where you are standardizing why is standardizing necessary because you may have several variables all with different units for example i may be dealing with one of the variables as rainfall in millimeters area in the hectares then soil moisture in millimeters per centimeter or percentage and so on so these units are all different and therefore it is advantageous to standardize them by standardizing i mean x minus x bar by s you deduct the mean and div uh, divide by the standard deviation then we get corresponding to each of the uh, variables you take the covariance with respect to the other variable remember covariance you take uh, with one variable with the other variable x into x into y the covariance of x with y covariance of x with z and so on covariance of x with itself is the variance so we get this covariance matrix of size p by p because it is a square matrix we take the eigen vectors and eigen values of these and then define the principal components corresponding to the eigen vectors and eigen values and obtain the new data set so from the original observed data set of n by p now we obtain another data set still of the same size n by p and the new data set is in terms of the principal components and they are all uncorrelated they are all the different principal components are orthogonal to each other so this is how we transform the original data set into a new data set where you are dealing with uncorrelated variables and you are dealing with orthogonal uh, vectors we will uh, take a simple example now uh, to demonstrate this procedure we are not right now worried about which is dependent and which is an independent variable for this particular uh, exercise we are taking two uh, variables rainfall and runoff so your p is equal to 2 and you have data for 15 years so these are 15 values now the mean of rainfall as you obtain from here is 108.5 centimeters 
and the mean of runoff is 38.3 centimeters. So, with this now we will come uh, see how we obtain the uh, principal components. First you look at this data 105, 115, uh, 103, 94 etcetera it goes on up to 85. Similarly, for runoff it starts with 40 to 46 and so on. So, this is the original matrix of data P is 2, this is rainfall, this is runoff and N is 15. There are 15 observations each available for the two variables. Now, I form a matrix X by taking by deducting mean of rainfall from this column and the mean of runoff from this column. Mean of rainfall is 108.5, mean of runoff is 38.3. So, 105 minus 108.5, so uh, I will round it off minus 1.3, similarly 3.4 and so on. So, this is how I form the matrix X. Now, X is simply X minus X bar. That is here I am taking x mi minus x bar, where x is the original data and x bar is the mean, uh, both for your rainfall as well as runoff. And that is how you obtain your values 1.3, 3.4 and so on. So, once you formulate the matrix x, we will also get calculate the covariance matrix. There are two variables x, y and x y here. So, let us say if I write x comma y recall from your earlier uh, lectures I am dealing with random variables here. So, uh, let us write capitals x and y. So, I will take a covariance and the covariance matrix is formed by covariance of x comma x here and x comma y y comma x and y comma y and the covariance between two variables is obtained as sigma x i minus x bar y i minus y bar divided by n minus 1, where n is the number of data 15 in this particular case. And x i is from your table here, this is x i, this is y i like this it goes. So, that is how you calculate the covariance matrix and these are the values as you obtain from there. You can do it as an exercise, you will get covariance is 216.67, 141.35 and x y is the same as y x and you will get these covariance matrix. This is a square matrix. So, let us obtain the eigen vectors and eigen values corresponding to uh, this, uh, this matrix now, covariance matrix. So, how do I get the eigen vectors? Remember, whenever you have a, a square matrix to get the origin vectors first you obtain the origin values. So, this is the A matrix let us say which is a covariance matrix as we obtained just now. We use determinant A minus lambda i is equal to 0. So, A minus lambda into this is a unit matrix is equal to 0. You will get lambda 1 is equal to 322.4 and lambda 2 is equal to 27.7. One of the lambda values is significantly higher compared to the other lambda value. We will see what is the significance of this, what is the implication of this when we do the regression using the principal components. We use these lambda values and like I did in the example corresponding to each of the lambda values you get a eigen vector. So, I will get the matrix of eigen vectors 0 0.801, 0 0.599 is one eigen vector and minus 0 0.599 and 0 0.801 is another eigen vector. Remember these eigen vectors are unit vectors in the sense that le let us take uh, the distance of the eigen vector indicated by the eigen vector that is this is one eigen vector. So, I will take square root of 0 0.801 square plus 0 0.599 square this is equal to 1. So, 
uh, generally any program if you use MATLAB etc and ask for eigenvectors, it returns unit vectors, unit, uh, unit eigenvectors. And by unit uh, you recall that we mean the distance given by the vector is 1. Similarly, you can see that the distance given by this is also equal to 1. So, starting with your original data, first you transform the original data into uh, a data consisting of deviations from the mean and then you also formulated the covariance matrix and this is the covariance matrix here. Covariance matrix is a square matrix of size p by p, p is equal to 2 here because you are dealing with 2 variables. Once you get the covariance matrix, you get the eigenvalues of the covariance matrix because it is a size 2 by 2, you will get 2 eigenvalues in general. So, lambda 1 is equal to 322.4 and lambda 2 is equal to 27.7. You obtain the eigenvalues, go to the eigenvectors uh, equation a minus lambda i x is equal to 0, from this you get x because lambda is given. So, first you put lambda 1 is equal to 322.4, you will get one eigenvector and lambda 2 is equal to 27.7 you get and you get the other eigenvector and you form the uh, matrix of eigenvectors. And these eigenvectors are unit vectors. Now, I just mentioned about the relative magnitudes of the eigenvalues. One is 322.4, another is 27.7. these have an implication on how we choose the principal components, how many of the principal components we choose. The eigenvectors corresponding to uh, uh, each of the lambda values, they explain the original variance to certain degree, which is related to the eigenvalues. What do I mean by explain? That is, so much of variance has been contributed by this particular eigenvector is what I mean by explaining the variance. Let us say you are talking about runoff as a function of rainfall and then you obtain uh, as a function of rainfall and another variable soil moisture let us say and you obtain the eigenvectors corresponding to e, uh, each of these that is you get two eigenvectors. The first eigenvector may explain 95 percent of the variance in the runoff whereas the second one may explain only 5 percent, which means you can afford to neglect, uh, ignore the second one. And therefore, you look at how much of the variance in the dependent variable is in fact explained by each of these different eigenvectors. And how do we do that? We uh, co compute or calculate the trace of S where trace of S is defined by simply summation of lambda j's. You got, got the eigenvalues, so add all the eigenvalues and that will define your trace of uh, S. And the fraction of the total variance accounted for by the jth principal component is lambda j by trace j. Simply you get lambda j by trace j that will give you the amount of variance that is explained by that particular uh, principal component. Uh, okay. So, in this particular case let us say lambda 1 is uh, you have 322.3 and this uh, trace s comes out to be 350.1, 350.1. So, the first component, uh, first principal component lambda 1 explains 92 percent of the variance. 0.92 uh, fraction which is 92 percent of the total variance is explained by the first principal component. And the remaining 8 percent is represented by the second component. Remember the first the identity of the original variables namely rain, uh, runoff and uh, rainfall and runoff is gone now, we are only dealing with the principal components and principal components are a linear combination of both the variables. So, you cannot relate lambda 1 to be runoff, lambda 2 to be uh, or lambda 1 to be rainfall and lambda 2 to be uh, runoff and so on. 
the original identity is gone. We are simply dealing with some transformed variables uh, lambda 1, lambda 2, etc., which are the eigenvalues and the eigen vectors, in fact, which define the principal components. We are dealing with the principal components. And therefore, in this particular case, you can afford to ignore the second uh, principal component if you are uh, dealing with uh, a regression relationship, which we will come to presently. So, this is how you carry out the principal component analysis. First, transform the data into uh, a data consisting of deviations, so that you are uh, centering the data in some sense. And if you have variables with different uh, units, you also standardize them and then formulate the matrix, uh, matrix X consisting of the transformed data. Then you form the covariance matrix corresponding to the covariance matrix, you obtain the eigenvectors and eigenvalues and look at how much of variance has been explained or how much of these, uh, how much of the variance is contributed by each of the eigenvectors. And that is the uh, objective of the principal component analysis. So, you form the principal components in terms of the eigenvectors and then look at how much of this information is coming from each of the principal components. What is the purpose of doing all this? We had a set of large number of variables and then we want to fit a regression relationship between a dependent variable and a, a number of independent variables. And we carry out the principal component analysis on the independent variables x1, x2, x3, etc., up to xp. There are p independent variables. We carry out the uh, carry out the principal component analysis. We know, let's say, you had p variables. You get the p uh, principal components or p eigenvectors. And we know each of these eigenvectors are the principal components. Their contribution to the variance in the uh, dependent variable. And we choose only those particular components, only those uh, principal components which are contributing significantly to the variance in the dependent variable. And that is what we do in regression using the principal components. So, we know now how to carry out the principal components we use this principal component analysis to do the regression. So, we had the original regression, from the original regression we are going on to regression with the principal components. Let us see how we do this. So, to continue the uh, example now, as I mentioned we said 92 percent of the variance is explained by the first component. So, we will neglect for the time being, we will neglect the second component. So, we will take only the first eigen vector and call it as the feature vector. So, we call it as the feature vector, we are choosing only the first one. You can choose both of them as feature vectors. So, feature vectors are those eigen vectors which are chosen for the further analysis. So, this feature vector now is 0 0.801, 0 0.599 corresponding to your first eigen vector. Then with this now, we obtain the new data set. This was your original data set minus 1.33.4, that is by original I mean these are the data sets that you used for the analysis. This is x and this is your a. These are the data sets formed with the deviations uh, from the mean and this is a and you will get z as the new data set. What has happened now? The original p by n matrix has been converted into 1 by n matrix. So, this is the transformed data. So, if you had 10 variables, you would have had 10 by n matrix and if you choose only one of uh, eigen vector, then you would get, you would still get 1 by n which means the remaining 9 you would have 
discarded in the sense that they they are not contributing so much to the variance or the first component alone is able to explain most of the variance or the first component alone is contributing to most of the information content in the uh, data set and therefore, you discard the other principal components and then deal with only this data set. Let us say we did not ignore the second one and still uh, we want to use the second eigen vector also. In which case we can choose this is 2 by n matrix and n is 15 here, I am sorry I have taken 10 values here. So, n is 10 here and then this is the 2 by 2 eigen, eigen matrix, this is one eigen vector, this is another eigen vector and so you will get 2 by 10. So, this is the transform data. So, like this from the original data you use the eigen vectors to get the transform data. Then we come to the question of regression using principal components. So, let us uh, quickly recall what we did in this example now. In this example Uh, what I have done is I have chosen only the 10 values here and then carried out uh, the exercise. I have gone up to 79 and 20. So, remember I have used only 10 values here. So, the same thing can be done with the remaining uh, uh, with the complete data set 15 values. So, these are 10 values and then I get a transform data of the, the remaining 10 values. So, from the two uh, independent variables, let us say that your uh, independent variables were rainfall and runoff for some purpose. From the two independent variables, you have got one data set now, which are all principal components. These are all called as the principal components. Uh, this is a Eigen vector and uh, uh, in fact, this is called as a principal component, which has a size of 1 by 10. So, this is the principal component that we are talking about. We can use this information because we know now that this principal component contributes to 92 percent of the variance in the data set. So, we can discard the other and then simply use this data set. In the multiple linear regression uh, expression, we will we'll come back to that topic now. In the multiple linear regression, you had several variables x1, x2, x3, etcetera. There are p variables, you get p principal components and p in, uh, principal components, you know the contribution of each of these principal components to the variance of the dependent variable y. Let me quickly tell what I mean by that. Let us say you have y is equal to you want to write it as a function of x1, x2, etcetera, xp, p variables and therefore, you get p principal components. And each of these p principal, principal components, the contribution to the variance in y or the variance in this particular data set can be obtained like we did in the example here. We got 92 percent. So, each of the principal components you can obtain what is the contribution to the variance. Then depending on that you can choose q of them less than p to be included in the regression equation. Let us say I choose only 2. If 2 of them can together explain about 95 percent of the uh, variance in y and so on. And then using only those two, we fit the regression relationship not on the original data, but now on the principal components. So, we have obtained the principal components, now you regress the dependent variable y with respect to the principal components. And that is what we do in the uh, next lecture. So, we will see how we take this principal component analysis forward and then apply them in uh, regression. 
where we are relating the depending dependent variable not with respect to the original variables, but with respect to the principal components. And remember principal components are a linear combination of the original variables themselves. And therefore, individual principal component does not indicate any particular physical variable that we considered earlier. For example, principal component number 1 does not indicate rainfall. It is some linear combination of rainfall and runoff both together in that particular example that I talked about. So, the regression that we develop now y as a function of principal component number 1, principal component number 2 and so on. We may have chosen q number of principal components with q being less than or equal to p will be a new regression relationship now. And what is the advantage that this has? This is now dealing with all uncorrelated variables because all the principal components are uncorrelated with each other. And it has also compressed the original data set in the sense that we are not choosing all the p principal components, but we are choosing some lesser number of principal components compared to the original number of variables. So, we will summarize now. So, we started with how to compute the eigenvectors and eigenvalues for a matrix. The eigenvectors are computed only for uh, square matrices, eigenvectors are defined uh, for square matrices. And to determine the eigenvectors, you first determine eigenvalues. Eigenvalues are determined by uh, determinant a minus lambda i is equal to 0, where a is the square matrix and i is the unit matrix. And then uh, once you get the lambda associated with the each of the lambda values, you have an eigenvector. You will get the eigenvector as a x is equal to lambda x, where x is the eigenvector. Then we went on to principal component analysis, where we uh, define the principal components as the eigenvectors in fact, of the covariance matrices, covariance matrices of p variables. So, you have a size of p by p and that is how we get the eigenvectors. These eigenvectors are in fact, the principal components. So, we also know how much of the variance is contributed by each of the eigenvectors. Depending on the uh, contribution of to the variance, we choose a few of them, few uh, eigenvectors to use in regression. So, in the next lecture then, we will start with regression using the principal components. So, we have arrived at the principal components starting with the original data. We will use the principal components in the regression and see uh, what is the information that we can derive out of that and what are the advantages arising thereof. Thank you for your attention. We will continue the discussion next time.